So this is a, a 45 year old gay man who was referred to our local hepatology clinic in May 2010 uh, from his primary care physician because he had gone in for some routine blood tests and the primary care physician had done liver enzyme testing and it said, oh, this gentleman has got abnormal liver tests. Can you please see him in the hepatology clinic? So just to work out what the abnormal liver tests were, he had an ALT of 112. This is international units per liter. In our laboratory, the upper limit of normal is 40. His AST was 152. Upper limit of normal is 40. Bilirubin was 32 micromoles per liter. So this, the upper limit of normal in the micromoles per liter in our laboratory is 17. Um, his albumin was 32 grams per, per, per deciliter. I think that's the same unit that's used everywhere in the world. Uh, so you'll all be familiar with that albumin. And the platelet count was 98. Again, it's um, cells per uh, times 10 to the power 9 cells per cubic liter. And his prothrombin time was 15 seconds, which was normal. So just, just so that you've digested these results... What do we need to do in terms of taking a further history? Remember, this is a guy who is being sent to the liver clinic. And I think that's the really important issue here. So what would you ask this patient? Does he take drugs? <laughs> yes. So does he take drugs? Yeah, absolutely. And how? Clearly very important. So, so, so Mike, why is, that, why is that so crucial in this? One of the concerns you might have is that he's caught um, either hepatitis B sexually, and of course you'd then want to know what his hep B surface antibody status was, or core antibody status, um, and he may have contracted hep C because there's lots of nasty hep C going around. I think the other thing, of course, is that you don't yet know whether he's HIV positive or not. Yeah, so, you know, clearly, you know, top of your list of differential diagnoses here is, you know, viral hepatitis, chronic viral hepatitis infection. And big question here is, you know, is there underlying HIV infection? And so the reason I brought this bit up here is how many of your primary care physicians or your hepatologists test for HIV in patients that are suspected of having a viral hepatitis infection? It's obvious you, you must uh, take uh, HIV uh, test first and uh, uh, the hepatitis B or C. Yeah, it's, it's clearly very important. I mean, in, in the UK, we think that 30% of our HIV remains undiagnosed because we don't think enough about mm. HIV testing. So let's, let's continue with the case. So actually a very 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 good history was taken um, from this patient by our uh, hepatology team so he as a single partner for over 20 years denied other risks when asked but had been treated for syphilis uh, 10 years ago drinks very little alcohol denied any recreational drug use but this wasn't asked specifically in terms of drugs but said do you use any recreational drugs no no i don't sir uh, no previous hiv test ever and no previous viral hepatitis tests ever uh, no medication or significant other medical history uh, and no family history of liver disease so this is the sort of history that you you need to get in terms of uh, looking at people with um, uh, uh, liver disease. He was examined, he was thin, had uh, bilateral small cervical lymph nodes, um, oropharyngeal candidiasis, so this was starting to ring alarm bells already. He had pulmonary erythema and multiple spider nevi, one centimeter palpable liver, but no splenomegaly, no ascites, no ankle edema. And he went on to have a number of tests performed. Very fortunately, he did have an HIV test and he was HIV-1 positive with a CD4 count of 120 at 19% viral load of 87,000 copies per ml. Hepatitis C IgG was positive. His RNA was positive at 1.2 million uh, international units per ml. And he has got genotype 1B hepatitis C. His hepatitis B S antigen negative, anti-core positive, anti-E positive, but anti-S negative. 
hepatitis A total antibody positive, syphilis clearly IgG positive, toxoplasma IgG positive, cryptococcal antigen negative, and he even went on to have an ultrasound scan which showed a liver with an irregular edge, dampened hepatic venous signal, and a spleen of 13 centimeters. Okay, so this is, you know, all the baseline tests that this guy had, and then, you know, a knee-jerk referral to the HIV hepatitis co-infection service, you need to manage this guy. Okay, so just hang on to those results for a second, because now I'm gonna ask you a multiple choice question. You have one answer to pick from. What other investigation do you want to do? Do you want to do a liver biopsy to stage his liver disease? Do you want a fibro scan to stage his liver disease? Do you want to do an upper GI endoscopy to assess for varices? Do you want to do more blood tests to look for other causes of liver disease? Or no, we have enough information to be able to make a treatment decision. So there is only one answer. One correct option. One correct option. I think what, what we're trying to point out here for all of you is that, that there's enough in this man's uh, clinical examination and his blood test to suggest that he's got advanced liver disease. So just, just so that you're aware, the first thing to look at is his liver enzymes. If you see a reversal of AST to ALT ratios, yes, that's a very, very good clue that this patient has got advanced liver disease, uh, i.e. cirrhosis, unless he's got alcoholic hepatitis or, or NASH or something else. But in the context of viral hepatitis, as soon as you start to see the ratio of AST to ALT reverse, then that should get alarm bells ringing. Especially if you see it with a low platelet count and a borderline low albumin that really does suggest that this patient has got uh, advanced liver disease. Um, the other thing that makes a suggestion that he's got advanced liver disease is that he's got stigmata uh, of end-stage liver disease, i.e. palmar eczema, spider nevi. So all of these are enough to make the diagnosis of advanced liver disease, and you really don't need to put this patient through a, a liver biopsy, and perhaps you don't need to stoop to sending him to the hepatologist for a fibro scan. What is really, really important is that we need to monitor for uh, complications of end-stage liver disease. The thing that is really very important for this patient, what's going to kill him uh, if not managed properly, is oesophageal varices, one of the, the complications of portal hypertension. And this is an algorithm, you don't need to, to look at this in great big detail, but this is the algorithm that hepatologists use for managing oesophageal varices in patients with end-stage liver disease. So, you know, whether they have varices that are uh, small or big, and whether there are child pew um, uh, classification on, on cirrhosis is, and whether you need to use non-selective beta blockers or not. And this is very, very important. Um, it is also very important to be able to prognosticate for this patient in, in terms of their end-stage liver disease. And there are a couple of scoring systems that one can use to prognosticate. There is the child pew scoring system, which uh, is slightly old and, 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 and slightly imprecise in that it doesn't really prognosticate in terms of um, morbidity and mortality, but it is very good for classifying patients in terms of natural history studies. So this is child pew scores are classified as A, B, or C, and these are the, the factors that one uses in order to give people those scores. Don't worry about the details of this, just be aware that the child pew score is available. Uh, and that becomes very important. Perhaps what's very important uh, in terms of predicting morbidity and mortality from end-stage liver disease is this score called the MELD score, which is a very complex equation. It's available on, on the internet uh, at the Mayo Clinic website, but it, it involves a number of things, bilirubin, prothrombin time, renal function, and then etiology of the end-stage liver disease. And there's clearly some data to suggest that the higher your MELD score, the higher your mortality rate in the time following the assessment of MELD. And in fact, in liver transplant assessment now, MELD scores are used to prioritize people in terms of who needs a transplantation uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, so let's go back to this patient. So he did have an upper GI endoscopy, and there was no oesophageal varices. There was just some 
portal hypertensive gastropathy. So, you know, we were, we were sure this man was going to have a little bit of portal hypertension, uh, but he was very lucky there was no varices. So I suppose the next really easy question is, treat his HIV or treat his hepatitis C? He's got a CD4 count of 120, viral load of 120,000. Okay, so we, we opt to start this man on, on antiretroviral therapy. We kind of decided that antiretroviral therapy first, get his HIV well controlled, and then we'll treat him or consider hepatitis C treatment. So there were two questions I was going to ask. Are there any drugs we should avoid in people with advanced liver disease? Uh, and are there any drug in combinations that are thought to be better for advanced liver disease than others? And so I put up a list of drugs here with loads of question marks, loads of issues, uh, but, but these are the sorts of things that one needs to think about. So clearly, nevarapine is associated with risk of hepatotoxicity. The risk of hepatotoxicity, I don't think it's any higher in people with advanced liver disease than those without advanced liver disease, but if you do get hepatotoxicity from nevarapine, then your risk of decompensation is very high in people who've got advanced fibrosis. Clearly, DDI is don't do it, is what DDI stands for. Uh, and so clearly we shouldn't be using DDI in, in the context of, of hepatitis C, HIV contraction. I don't think we should be using DDI for anybody, to be perfectly honest. Um, we know that trypanavir, ritonavir, is associated with increased risk of hepatotoxicity. It's primarily driven by the higher dose of, of uh, ritonavir that we use with trypanavir. And I don't think anybody ever uses trypanavir. Right? Unfortunately, there are still HIV mm. access programs that continue to use D40. So I was in Vietnam recently, and they still use D40 as their first line uh, nuke backbone. Low dose. Low D40. dose. Absolutely. Now, I've put Darunavir up there as a provocative discussion uh, because uh, there was some early data to suggest that, that Darunavir was associated with hepatotoxicity in specific subgroups of patients, and there were uh, a number of reported deaths with Darunavir in the, the early registration studies. These were only a handful of patients. I do have to say that the vast majority of these were hepatitis B. Um, HIV co-infected patients, and we don't know what the mechanism of this uh, was. We think this is probably immune restitution flares rather than toxicity of darunavir, but that's something to bring into the discussion. I think the, dr the drug that's causing a lot of interest at the moment is maraviroc, and whether maraviroc has an antifibrotic effect within the, the, the liver or not. There are uh, certainly data being generated regarding this. I'm not so sure that these data are very strong, uh, but that's something that, that comes up in discussions every now and again. Okay, so he starts combination antiretroviral therapy. I use one of my uh, favorite regimens, which is Truvada and boosted Lopinavir, i.e. Kalitra. He also gets cotrimoxazole for 80 milligrams once a day as primary PCP prophylaxis. I'm not sure that was really required, but we went for it anyway. Um, and he has a fantastic... HIV, biological response, and by week 12, actually, he's uh, HIV undetectable. CD4 counts are up to 220 at 22%. We followed his liver enzymes very carefully. His ALT is 82, ST90. Platelets have gone up a little bit. Prothrombin time remains normal, and in fact, his albumin is climbing. So we're doing very well with this man. So my next question now to you is, what other monitoring does he need? So, should we do six monthly fibro scans? Should we send him to the hepatologist to try and get the fibro scan in clinic? Shall we do three to four monthly HCV RNA levels? Shall we do annual upper GI endoscopies? Shall we do six monthly ultrasound scans and alpha fetoproteins? Shall we do all of the above or we don't really know. So I think it's really important. I and mean, one of the key issues for people with cirrhosis and hepatitis C is hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance. Hepatocellular carcinoma in the context of HIV and hepatitis C co-infected patients particularly is becoming very important as a cause of morbidity and mortality in our group of patients. We really need to monitor for this. So these are the, the American recommendations for, they, they've now been uh, adopted by um, ASLD, re recommendation for surveillance of hepatocellular carcinoma and certainly hepatitis C cirrhotic patients 
patients. Um, the patients should be screened six to 12 monthly, some say three to four monthly. It's what you can afford to do, but as a minimum, uh, at least twice a year, and if not that, at least once a year. Um, alpha feed pro protein alone should not be used for screening uh, unless an ultrasound scan is not available. Alpha feed proteins are not very sensitive uh, and very specific. Um, the surveillance interval does not need to be any shorter than four months, even in those people at the highest risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are the guidelines, so just so that you're aware. Certainly at the Royal Free, we would do six monthly ultrasound scans on patients with, um, with cirrhosis, uh, either with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or, or non-viral uh, hepatitis cirrhosis. For hepatitis B patients who are well controlled on tenofovir-based antiviral regimens, we would screen once a year rather than twice a year because we can't afford to do any more than that and our, our radiology department's not up to it. Okay, so six months post-antiretroviral therapy, his CD4 counts now reasonable. It's 280 at 24%. So even by the, the uh, Romanian national guidelines, he would be ready for uh, anti-hepatitis C treatment. His um, liver is stabilized out, uh, and we, we now ask the question, is it time to tackle the hepatitis C? So what are the issues when you want to treat patients with what we think is advanced fibrosis with pegylated interferon ribavirin? What sorts of things do we need to think about? And I just ask, he's had a partner for 20 years. Um, a, did the partner get an HIV test? <laughs> B, were they having sex? C, is the partner HIV or hepatitis C positive? <laughs> D, are they still having sex? And E, is he now knowing that he's HIV positive and feeling rather better after doubling his CD4 count out on the town having sex with anybody else? Yeah. Because I think the public health side of it also is part of an issue. Okay, so let's answer those questions backwards. He is HIV is very well controlled, but he's not feeling better because he's hepatitis C infected, in fact, feeling very fatigued uh, and hardly able to go out uh, to a club, let alone go and have sex. His partner is HIV, Hep B, Hep C negative, um, and they are having sex, which is protected as sex only now. But clearly important. I'm sorry I didn't kind of go into that, but that those are all the things that, that needed to be tackled right at the beginning of all the treatment decision making. Okay, there are some other issues about tackling the, the hepatitis C and I just wanted to bring, bring these up for you. So one of the, 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 the predictors of response to peg interferon ribavirin is the level of fibrosis. Well, there's loads of data sets and I only brought this, this data set up. This is Rafael Bruno's work um, from Italy, looking at SVRs with peg interferon and weight-based ribavirin based on um, your ISHAC scores. ISHAC scores are very similar to Metavis scores, except that it's, it's five and six that are kind of really advanced fibrosis. And you can see as you get down to being cirrhotic, which is uh, ISHAC six, your likelihood of response to peg interferon ribavirin is less than 10%. Uh, and so this is a really important consideration, so people need to be aware that the more advanced fibrosis you have, the less likely you are to respond to peg interferon ribavirin. I, I'm not sure why that's the case, why advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis affects your response to peg interferon ribavirin if everything else is equal. My feeling is that it's, it's a blood supply to the hepatocytes that's disrupted by being fibrotic, so you don't get enough drugs into the hepatocytes uh, because of, of uh, the fibrosis and, and collagen deposition. There's another little thing that we need to, to, to bring into this in that patients who are cirrhotic when given peg interferon ribavirin are at risk of hepatic decompensation. We saw this from the, the early days of the apricot study um, where there were in fact deaths associated with hepatic decompensation in those patients that had very advanced liver fibrosis who got peg interferon ribavirin. Um, Stefan Maas did a very nice uh, uh, kind of analysis based on a very small number of patients and the thing that's dropped off from the bottom here 
is the use of DDI was probably the most important factor in terms of risk of decompensation uh, in cirrhotic patients, but other things play an important role too. Uh, and so the, the, the risk of decompensation is not zero even if you don't use DDI. So please be aware that you know, patients with uh, advanced liver disease are at risk of hepatic decompensation with peg interferon ribavirin. What about the newer drugs? And I'm going to finish in a, in a minute. This is a realized study, which is a telaprovir study in mono-infected patients. I don't want you to take any of that away, just to take away the pooled analysis, as, as Karin was saying, that even with, with the new therapies, if patients are cirrhotic or have got advanced fibrosis, they tend to respond less well than patients who've got lower stages of, of liver disease. Uh, I think the, the thing that worries us m much more than that in patients with, with advanced liver disease and fibrosis is the risk of serious adverse events. This is the CUPIC, I, I don't know if you call it the study, it's the French expanded access program for telaprovir and posaprovir, really, isn't it, uh, in mono-infected patients. And I, I think there are uh, something like 450, nearly 500 patients on the CUPIC program um, who are either previous uh, partial responders or relapses to peg interferon and ribavirin who've been given telaprovir and busaprovir in combination with peg and riba. And then you can see that ser serious adverse events are almost up to 50% uh, in patients, in, in this group of patients. And that there, there is the, the risk of hepatic decompensation and death remains, and if I can remember correctly, I, I, Karine and, and Patrick can correct me, that the risk of death or the cause of death tended to be sepsis or infection events rather than anything else. Uh, so, mm. you know, we need, even with the triple therapies, we need to be careful. Although having said that, the early virological responses from um, the cubic study, certainly out to week 12, in smallish numbers of patients that have made it so far, both on an intention to treat and an own treatment analysis, looks like they're, they're doing reasonably well in terms of uh, virological responses. Okay, I think that's the end of that case. What did I do with him? He got peg interferon ribavirin and responded very well, but I didn't show you that. He cleared virus with peg and riba. <laughs> <laughs>